Today is the second to last lecture. It's, I think it's the most general in terms of the scope of the lecture. So basically everything that is said here applies to normal software development. There is not much like specific stuff about testing web application except what I said at the very first lecture. So you should take into account some stress testing to accommodate your application becoming very popular in a very short time. The overview is, well, the, the title is Debugging, Testing and Quality, and these are exactly the three parts that we are going to talk about. And since I'm not an expert on software quality, I got an expert to talk for us about software quality. So we will have guest lecture later on. So let's start with debugging. It's basically tracing the execution of the system. And as you know, Vadin application consists of two parts. It's the server side code and the client side code. And mostly when we are developing an application, we are coding the server side part. So one would expect you can debug it exactly the same way as a normal Java app. That's actually true, except that I found a few issues in older versions of Eclipse when using Maven and debugging that. I don't know if the issue has been solved in the most recent version of Eclipse, but be aware that it may not be able to find all the source folders when needed. You can, of course, debug from command line. This is kind of a hard way to do it. You can also change IDE to something else, like most IDEs support Java debugging. At least I haven't found any that is not supporting it. So the workflow is typical. So you place a breakpoint, you instead of running the application, you debug the application. And then once the execution hits the point of the breakpoint, then it stops. Nothing fancy about that. Typically, IDEs have some sort of debugging view associated with it. So there usually is a way to see all the running processes, local variables, so the memory at the current position, so what are the values in different variables in different fields, place where you can navigate through source code, an outline usually of the currently executed code. And then of course, probably very important in, the, in terms of non-structured testing is the debug output or the console output. So we typically put some system print lines to see where exactly we are. While debugging each IDE, I guess, supports at least these four operations, they might be named differently in different IDEs, but their idea is the same. So you can always execute to the next line in the current scope. You can step out or step return. So you continue execution in the current scope or the current method, and then you stop immediately when you exit it. You can do the opposite, so you can take a step in, which means that the current line, you just go into the first line inside the method that you're currently debugging. And then, of course, very useful is the run to line option. So you continue execution until you reach the line in which you have cursor. Some productivity tips that I found useful when debugging is first and foremost, learn and use keyboard navigation. So debugging with a mouse by pressing those tiny buttons in Eclipse at least is frustrating. And I kind of never memorized which button serves which purpose, even though they have clear icons, I never managed to do it. And I always find myself clicking the wrong one. So I learned key bindings to that. And when I switched IDE to IntelliJ, I was in big trouble because I couldn't memorize the new key bindings. But then it struck me, so I started using a gaming keyboard, you know, those pros that, that play games for a living, which is kind of, by the way, I think awesome way to earn money. They use keyboards with macros. You have keys that you can assign different key bindings to. And this works amazingly well with software development. I mean, a bunch of helpful Eclipse key bindings is something like 40 positions. Memorizing them all is kind of hard, but you can just have them on like macros. So you just press one key and, and it's there. And the benefit of that is that when you switch IDE, you can assign the same keys to different keystrokes depending on that IDE. I found it really, really useful. Another thing that you kind of learn 
while developing software is that you should place breakpoints efficiently. So to avoid meaningless stops. And from time to time, it might be beneficial to silence all the breakpoints. So at least Eclipse and IntelliJ have the option to completely ignore current breakpoints, which means that the execution continues uninterrupted until you enable the breakpoints again. So you might want to, for example, navigate first to a view that is causing problems and then enable breakpoints and then click that button that causes the problem. Also, you can use something I call smart breakpoints. So most breakpoints can have properties, so they can have a condition under which they are true, or they can have a hit count, so you can stop when you reach certain number of encountering that place. That also helps in managing the debugging process. Very often is, for example, no use to place a breakpoint just to skip through it many times if you know that it's happening only if for example, there is a null pointer exception. So you might want to have a condition on the line before that that stops when that certain parameter is null. And then you can trace the execution, what actually happened and how did we end up there. But that's the server side debugging. Vadin has also client side debugging. And when you're doing your custom components or custom widgets, then you have some client side code, which is the Java code that gets compiled to JavaScript. As such, it's running in a browser and the IDE has absolutely no access to it. So under normal circumstances, there is no way to debug that except by placing breakpoints in the browser that supports that. And then you just navigate through JavaScript, which may or may not have some reference to the Java code that you have written. Most likely it won't. What I try to do is that I try to avoid it. So I tend to write code that doesn't break. You can guess how successful I am with that. Anyway, at least for Eclipse, you have dev mode and super dev mode. The first one I think is discontinued from Google nowadays. This means that the JavaScript code is compiled on the fly as needed. And that means you can place breakpoints in Eclipse and it will work. Super dev mode means you can debug from a browser that supports source maps. I think Chrome is currently the only one doing it. Some years ago, Firefox was adding support to that. I don't know if they have succeeded. Setting this up is kind of beyond the scope of the lecture. It's a very advanced thing, I would say. There is a link to the official documentation. You can click, read, and follow. There are ways to avoid that debugging the client-side code. One of them is the debug mode. You add a debug parameter to the URL address. And that displays a debug window. It works with any Vadin application. So I'll start my IDE in the background so that I can then show you how it works. The thing is that it does not debug the JavaScript code, but instead it might give you some meaningful error messages. And if you configure, for example, Eclipse on the Vadin specific settings, there is a way to not obfuscate the JavaScript code, which makes it, of course, a bit longer. But then the names of variables and methods are slightly more meaningful than A, B, and C. And of course, the errors are highlighted in the console of the debug window. You get also access to the framework log with the debug mode. So all the processing times, uh, potential layout errors, some details of the response, so you can figure out what exactly has the client side received from the server. What are the contents of that? What are the components that it's referencing? And so on and so on. You can see the debug window here. And uh, there are a few tabs. You can see the connector hierarchy tree, so the components. You can select a component on the page to inspect it. So for example, this is a flat select connector. It has a caption, it has a width, all the nice features. Here is the communication. You can get the details of the response. So that was just a shared state response. And then you have, for example, a change in variables or in options. So this is quite a handy tool in debugging the flow of information, for example, between the client side and the server side. So let's talk about testing. This is like a way of, well, not ensuring that your application is really free from bugs because you really can't do that, but to somehow ensure that at least the major features work as expected in normal circumstances. And of course, we have JUnit for that. It's a unit testing framework that is based on annotations and a bunch of static assert methods. It's 
Java, so you basically write tests and specifications in Java as you would write normal production code. And it's part of the something I call foo unit family. So every language has its own implementation of that framework. And it's very good for test-driven development that I'm going to talk about just in a minute. And as I said, since it's Java, it's, I think, supported by every Java IDE. So there is a built-in support for that, for showing you the test results in a graphical form that is very easy to follow and spot the failing unit tests. This is how a life cycle of a test class works. And as I said, it's based on annotations. So you place one of five different annotations on the methods and only the middle one is really required. So when the test class loads, we have before class, methods executed. Then for each test we have a before test and after and once all the tests are done in the class then we have after class executed. So the first two they are intended to be on a static method in that class. They can throw exceptions of course and they are run once for a test class. And this is very useful for managing the resources so the external resources that you have for tests. In particular it might be useful for database setup. Um, then we have before and after, so they annotate instance methods. They can throw exceptions, of course, and they are executed before or after each and every test. This might be something that is easy to forget, that if you have some time-consuming or memory-consuming operation, you may end up in your tests running for a really, really long time. That's because you probably intended to have them in before class, not before test method. And you can use it to populate or finalize test data to make sure that every test has the same set of data. And finally, we have the test annotation, which is the heart of JUnit. It's going to be used on instance methods, and it contains a single test, which in turn is a Java code that has one or more assertions. It should be compact, and it should test one thing only. So no workflows or anything like that, just one particular thing that you're interested in. And it's best if the name of the method actually reflects what you're testing in there. So to have the thing called self-documented tests. So by reading the test, you know what's going on, what are the requirements for the thing that you're testing. And if any of the assertions fails, then the test fails. And none of the further assertions are checked. And if there are no assertions or there are no fails, then the test is okay. It may be that the expected behavior of a test is to throw an exception. Well, you should actually test for those things in particular. So you annotate, instead of just a test annotation, you add an expected exception type as a parameter to that annotation. And then if you do not receive an exception by running that method, or if you receive some other exception, then the test has failed. What else? One thing here is that the tests are run in a random order. So if you want to have a particular thing happening before something or after something, then you should use before and after annotations. And you should never rely that a particular suite of tests will be run in a given order. It will change. And then the assertions, so what are they? They are not exactly the same thing as a keyword in Java, that is called assert, but they kind of serve the same purpose. They are defined as, as static methods in assert class, so you can just import all of them with this line. And there is a bunch of them. Basically, they fail the test when the condition they're checking is not true. If you cannot find anything that fits your purpose, like equality, samenessness, null, not null, uh, or so on, you can assert anything by just providing a code that you are willing to check. So there is plenty of options. And as an example, I have here a JUnit code with some setup that sets up the data for each test. In this particular case, it's setting up a container with 27 items and adds number and text properties to them. And then I'm assigning it to a field of the test class. So each test method has an access to the container here. So I can create a component, in this case it's an item grid. I can set its data source to be this container and then I can assert certain things here. And this is called test when created, so I would assume that it's testing the state of the component right after you create it. So then it kind of connects to the, if you remember from the lecture about custom widget creation, I said something about meaningful default state. So this is testing it. And you can see that the code is quite simple to read. It's very easy to write. So it's just Java. So now that you know 
how to write tests, what to test. Well, basically you should test everything. You should test 100% of the code that you have written. And of course, this is not doable at all. Instead, you should test what makes sense. For example, testing setters and getters for properties makes very little sense. There is just one line of code that usually assigns the parameter to the field of the class. There's no point in testing that. It just can't go wrong. Of course, once they do some side effects, then you probably want to test those. There is also not that much sense in testing the client code as it will be compiled to JavaScript, but you can do that. Just remember to exclude that code from the JS compilation process. You should test what can be tested and by what can be tested I mean what the tests have access to. So the test class is a separate object that has absolutely no connection with the class that you're testing. Testing private methods for example is a bit difficult. Testing protected methods is somewhat better and of course public methods well then you have access to those. At the bare minimum, you should test the critical functionality of your application so that you are certain that core features, they work. And of course, once you have an application uh, that has a suite of tests, then once you add something new, you should probably test that. There are a few things that are difficult to test and they correspond with what I said at the very, very first lecture of this course. Time and responsiveness are really hard to test. I mean, you can't guarantee time in tests, you should provide wide enough margins for that. So if you expect something to happen within a second, well then test if it happens within five seconds. And still you might run into a situation where it actually happens even later than that and your test fails. It's kind of hard by nature to test any random things, but you can use random seeds. So you can guarantee that the sequence of random numbers is every time the same random numbers. It's difficult to test threads, so if your application is running in threads, you might be better testing those methods directly instead of testing different threads at the same time. And then of course the hardest part of all to test is the graphical user interface. This is something that there are books about and there are tools about. And one of those is Vadin's test bench. I would say or summarize it that this JUnit for graphical user interface. It's part of a commercial offering as Vadin Designer is. You can get a free trial just from the web page. It's an automated graphical user interface test with JUnit. So you basically code the way as you would do in JUnit except that there is an extra syntax for your graphical user interface and for referencing the components that you have on the page. To follow the principle of eating your own dog food or drinking your own champagne or whatever is the fancy name for that, the Vadin framework has more than six and a half thousands of tests written in TestBench to make sure that it actually runs the same on all browsers. It's quite a powerful tool. And as an example, you can see the test case for the default application that the Maven generates. So, you know, the thing that shows a button and when you click it, then it says, thank you for clicking. We use some JUnit stuff. So this is a normal JUnit test. You can see an annotation here. You can see the assert here and here, except that there are a few things extra. Most often you open test URL in a test and then you need to use the dollar syntax to find particular element. So this is like a search query language, I would say, in Java. You provide an element type and then you specify a number of filters for that and then you get a collection of those elements that are present on the page and then you can access those. So you can, for example, search for a first button with a caption called click me. We're using this line or you can search for the first label on the page with this query here. And what is really nice is that the elements, not to be confused with Vadin elements, but the test elements, they expose the API of the component they correspond to. So once you fetch that button, you can actually click it from the test. That means that you have simulated the same action as a user who would, you know, point mouse cursor over that and click it. And you can see it highlighted in yellow. So for example, for a button, you can click it, but for a label, you can get a text of the label. You can connect those two. Let's continue with the lecture. So the previous part of that was a crash course in JCourse, and this is a crasher course in test-driven development. So this is in general a software development paradigm that you start by having a test, and then you see if the test fails. If it fails, then you write production code that actually passes the test. And then you rinse and repeat that. There are 
three principles of test-driven development. The first one is uh, the famous WTF, so write tests first. Then you have to fail the test. So once the test is written and you have no code, it should fail. That's the principle. And then the tested unit, the thing that will become your production code, should be small so that it's easy to test. The tests are written before there is a functionality to test, but after it's already known. And that's ensuring that your code is actually testable. And you can already identify problems with the functionality interface, so the public API at this point, and then you can act accordingly. Once you fail the test, it makes sure that the test is good. So it catches the error and does not pass for a dummy code. So that's very important. And if you keep the tested unit small, that it's again the self-documentation, it's reducing the bugging time and so on and so on. Things to avoid. So when you're testing, you should not rely on order of test execution. That's what I said previously, which means that test cases must be independent one from another. You should not be precise when testing time. That's what I said also previously. And this is like a very important one. You shouldn't test more than you really need to. So test what the code should do and nothing more. Do not assume certain things because you know how they are implemented. As the test-driven development says, you should actually write that before you start implementing. So they should be independent from implementation, the tests. And you should not forget about other types of tests. So regression tests, making sure that your application behaves as previously, uh, and integration tests so that your application actually behaves nice when you connect all the elements of it.